Hello and welcome to yet another tutorial by Davies Media Design. My name is Michael Davies and in today's tutorial I'll be showing you what's new in GIMP 2.10.12. But of course before I get into that I want to direct you guys over to my website at DaviesMediaDesign.com. As always we have GIMP help articles and video tutorials on here so definitely check that out. You can also translate our website using a variety of languages up here in the top left. If you don't see your native language here and you would like it added to the site, please let me know in the comments. But you can enroll in my GIMP 2.10 Masterclass from Beginner to Pro Photo Editing on Udemy. And you can enroll in any of my classes on Skillshare by visiting GIMPschool.com. So I'm very excited about the new features that come with this latest update of GIMP 2.10.12 because it fixes not only a lot of bugs, but it also adds a lot of really cool new features that I think will be very helpful for a variety of projects. For starters, the GIMP team has made improvements to the Curves tool, including all other places where the Curves tool needs tweaking, including paint dynamics and with input device settings. So let's open up our Curves tool here inside of GIMP 2.10.12 and we can do that, of course, by coming over here to Colors, Curves. So here is our standard Curves tool, which a lot of you who do photo editing will recognize. And the first feature I'll show you is going to involve existing points on the curve. So when you click your mouse on the curve here, that's going to create a point. And let me just create a couple other points here. So I created one up in the top region here and one in the bottom region, as well as one in the center. So you'll notice that as I drag my mouse around, there are X and Y coordinates here. A new feature of this Curves tool is that now when I hover around the area of that point I just created, you'll see that the X and Y coordinates will freeze on this. So even if I'm not directly on top of this point, whenever I hover really close to it, it's going to give me the exact coordinates of this point. So that just makes it a little bit easier to read the exact location of the points on your curve. And this applies to all the points that you already have created here. So you can see that all three of these are doing that. It's just sort of freezing the coordinates right there. Another really cool new feature, it's a simple addition, but it really makes life easier, is if I hold the control key, I can create a point along the curve here. So for example, if I just click on this curve, you'll see that the point that's created on the curve is going to be wherever I just put my mouse. So wherever my mouse clicked is where that new point is created. Let me hit the delete key just to delete that point and I'll also click on this point and hit the delete key again. So this new feature allows you to, and again, I'm holding control, it allows you to create points on the curve without the curve snapping to wherever your mouse pointer is. So if I click right here, for example, you'll see that that's going to add a point right here on the curve, but nothing is going to change about the curve. It's just going to add the point along the existing curve here. And once again, I'll hit the delete key. Another cool thing is if I hold the control key and click, I can drag this point around existing points on my curve. And if I go outside of the existing points, it'll disappear. But if I come back inside the existing points, you'll see I can drag this around and just place this wherever I want. And here are my X and Y coordinates for this new point I created. Once again, I'll hit the delete key. One thing you may have noticed while I was doing that is that there are new features down here called spin buttons. And here we have the input and output values. So for example, if I come over here, I'll hold control and click to create a new point. That's going to give us the exact X and Y coordinates of this new point we created. You'll see that these values match up with these values. But this allows us to, while we're clicked on this point, manually make adjustments to the location. So you can see that as I adjust the input, that is changing the X value of my point. And as I click on the output value, that is changing the Y value. And of course, down here, we can just manually set numerical values. So that allows us to have a little bit more control there. We have manually set some values here. You'll notice that that kind of automatically adjusted after I typed 80. And that's just because that point cannot go to 80. So it's going to automatically bring this back to whatever point this is capable of having or whatever value this is capable of having, I should say. So there I can set it to 68, 68 will work. So now that is set to the X value of 68 and the Y value of 60. Next to these spin buttons here is the type. So that's another new feature, which is that you can change the type of your curve here between a curve, which is of course the normal setting where you have one point producing a curved line that goes through the next point and it curves from that point into the next one. So that is the standard option there. Then you have another option here called corner. So if I click corner, you'll see that that's going to convert the lines coming from this point into straight lines. So it's almost like being in polygonal mode uh, when we're using other tools, but this is going to apply to this curve. So if I put all of these set to corner, you'll see that all my lines now become straight lines. So that just allows you some more flexibility there with the curve. I'll come down here and click reset. 
By the way, I think I called the first option the default option here, curve. It's called smooth, but either way, it's going to create a curve versus a straight line. So I'll just hit cancel to exit out of this. The next feature is that TIFF images can now be exported with the layer still intact versus automatically merging all of the layers onto a single layer before exporting to that TIFF file. So if I come over here to file, open recent, and come over here to document history, I'm just gonna navigate to a composition that I have that already has a lot of layers. So I'll go with this isometric building composition, which I created in a tutorial on how to create an isometric building in GIMP. So definitely check that out. But I'll double click on this to open it up and I'll hold control and use my mouse wheel to zoom out. So here we have my isometric building composition. And if I come over here to the layers panel, you'll see there are tons of layers in here. So now I'll come over here and go to file, export as, and I'm going to name this isometric building.tiff and I'm going to hit the enter key. And now you'll see here under the export image as TIFF options, we have the option to save the layers. So if I keep that checked and hit export, and now I'll come over here to file, open recent, and we'll go to isometric building.tiff. And I'm getting some error messages here. So I'll just click OK and you'll see that all of the layers are located here. And I have the options to select all of the layers and to open the pages as layers. And I'll hit import and we'll see what actually transfers here. So we have a composition here opened up as a TIFF with the layers intact. The issue is that these were layer groups actually. So you could see that actually not all of the layer groups even transferred over and the colors look a little bit weird. So this is probably still a work in progress with GIMP, but apparently GIMP can now export uh, to a TIFF with the layers intact, relatively speaking. So I'm just gonna exit out of this composition. The next new feature is one that I'm only going to go over briefly just for the sake of time, but this is the ability to add custom or third-party fonts as a Windows user when you are not an admin on your computer. So you may be a user on your computer and somebody else is the admin and they've just given you an account to use on that computer. Before you couldn't add fonts to GIMP unless you were the admin of that computer, you needed admin permission first, which may have included a sign-in. But now they've created a new folder where you can add fonts and this is supposedly a temporary fix for now, but it will eventually be a permanent fix. And they did have a big call for Windows developers to be able to spend more time on things like this, make more permanent fixes, and just be able to make the GIMP experience a little bit better on Windows altogether. So if you're a GIMP developer, definitely reach out to the GIMP team. But this does give you the ability now to add fonts to GIMP as somebody other than an administrative user. The next new feature found in this latest GIMP update is that they have improved the painting overall. And I will say that I did not notice exactly where the painting has been improved because I didn't use this feature very much before since I thought that the paint features found in GIMP were a little bit lacking and I felt that the tablet didn't work very well in GIMP. But I will say that trying out the tablet now in this latest version of GIMP has shown that it does work a little bit better and it appears that the pressure dynamics also respond a little bit better than they used to. So here I have my Wacom tablet and I've already got it set up and you guys can check out my tutorial on how to set this up in GIMP. But if I come over here with my tablet to the paintbrush tool, and I come down here and I can set my dynamics to something else. So let's go with something that did not used to work very well, which is going to be pressure opacity. So this is going to provide the brush dynamics where the more pressure I put on the tip of my pen, the more opaque the painting is going to be or the color that I'm using to paint with. So the softer I apply pressure to this, the less opaque or the more transparent the color will be. So if I test this out, you can see I'm putting very little pressure and nothing's really showing up. If I add a little bit more pressure, it's a little darker now, it's starting to show up. And then if I do full pressure, you can see that now it is nice and dark. So that's actually something for me that did not work very well in GIMP, the pressure dynamics. So it appears that that has been fixed or at least improved. I'm not sure if that's exactly where the improvements have been made, but it does appear, at least on my end, that that is where the improvements happened. I'll hit Control Z to undo that. And while we're on the subject of painting, they've also made improvements to the symmetry painting feature. And you can access this by coming over here to Windows, Dockable Dialogs, and come down here to Symmetry Painting. So this feature allows you to easily paint symmetrical objects. So if I come over here to Symmetry and I change this to Mirror, 
and then I come down here and I check off the horizontal symmetry option. You'll see that'll create a horizontal line on my composition. And I'll come back here to my layers panel, create a new layer. And I'm just going to name this painting. Make sure I have the fill list set to transparency and click OK. So now whatever I paint on the top is going to be mirrored onto the bottom as well. So if I grab my pen tablet here once again and I paint something, you can see, and once again, I do have the pressure opacity still turned on. But if I draw some weird shape here, I don't know, this looks like an alien shape or something. But you can see that everything I draw on the top is being mirrored on the bottom. So that's what symmetry painting does. But the GIMP team says that there used to be artifacts that showed up when you were painting with a large brush, as well as when you were painting with the clone tool or the heel tool. So those artifacts supposedly had been fixed. And the ink tool also had some bugs fixed inside of the symmetry tool. So they claim that now you should have a much easier experience, a much more consistent experience when painting with the symmetry tool inside of GIMP. You do have to make sure you come back over here to the symmetry tool and turn this back to none. And then we can close this out. And I'll come back here to the layers panel. The next new feature is found in the dodge and burn tool. And this is the ability to tick the incremental option. So if I come over here to my dodge and burn tool and I scroll down here inside of my tool options, you'll see that now we have something called incremental. And this was something that was originally available with the pencil tool, the paintbrush tool, and the eraser tool. And essentially what this does is it overrides your existing opacity setting on your tool. And it allows you to incrementally add more and more effects to whatever it is that you're painting with. For example, if I come over here to opacity and I have this turned way down, and remember we are on our dodge and burn tool, I have the type set to burn here. So if I hold control and zoom in, if I use this tool on, for example, my subject's face, and let me turn the size down too so it's not quite as large. So if I paint on here with the burn tool, this is going to basically darken areas uh, wherever I paint with it. And you can see there's not a whole lot of effect happening here. So there is a limit usually when you're painting with the dodge and burn tool as to how much opacity is going to be painted with this tool on something like a subject if you're painting on a subject. Whereas if you have this set to incremental, it's basically just going to keep continuously compounding that effect over and over again. And that allows you to just create a darker and darker effect. So if I come down here now and I check the incremental option, remember we had this set to a pretty low opacity here. But now with this incremental option, if I just keep going back and forth with this, you'll see it's just going to continuously compound this effect and it's gonna get darker and darker here until it creates this really awful, almost like burnt spot on the page, on the image I should say. So that's what the incremental option does is it allows you to just continuously compound an effect as you move your mouse back and forth when you're painting with whatever tool you're using. So hold control and zoom out on my composition here and I can also hit control shift J to center that back up. Next up we have updates made to the free select tool and this is kind of cool. So I'll come over here and grab my free select tool. Usually when you drew with this in earlier versions of GIMP, you would have to hit the enter key in order to apply the free select area that you drew and see what's called the marching ants. And those are basically those moving dotted lines that denote where the end of your selection area is. So if I come over here, for example, and I draw this, you'll see that there's no marching ants. It's just a solid line as we draw. But now the newest feature is that when I connect this line, so when I close the shape and release my mouse, it's going to automatically give us a preview of the selection area we just drew with these marching ants. So this is now an active selection area, which means I can go about my business with filling this in with the color, or I can copy the selection area and paste it somewhere else. But basically this is a live selection area already without having to hit the enter key. But there's also some flexibility added to this. So if I come down here and look at my title and status bar while I'm hovered over the selection area, you'll see it says a few directions here. So by hitting the return or the enter key, it's going to commit the selection or it's going to apply the selection and make it essentially you know, permanent for you to be able to edit inside of that area. Hitting the escape key is going to close this out entirely and cancel the selection. And hitting the backspace key is going to reopen the shape and allow you to continue editing the shape from the last point where you left off. So let's demonstrate that real quick. So if I hit the escape key, that's going to totally cancel that out. Let me just redraw that random shape here, close it off. Hitting the enter key is going to apply it. So now you can see we have the selection area with the marching ants. I'll hit control shift A to deselect that area. The third option of course is to 
draw and close your area off. But if I hit the backspace key, you'll see it's going to reopen our shape from the point where we left off, which was up here. And now I can continue drawing more of a shape and I'm just gonna do a totally random shape, bring it back in. And if I close it off, it will again bring up our marching ants. So now all this area is inside our selection area. And I haven't hit the answer key yet, so I haven't committed to this or applied it, but I can still grab another tool which will automatically apply this shape. It won't, you know, delete it automatically or anything. It will apply that shape. So if I come over here, grab my bucket fill tool, you'll see that shape now becomes committed. I can create a new layer here and I can fill in the shape. So I'll hit Control Shift A to deselect that and I'll just click on the delete this layer option here to delete that painting layer I just created. The next new feature is probably my favorite new feature found in GIMP 2.10.12 and this is the brand new offset feature. This feature allows you to easily create patterns inside of GIMP, especially seamless patterns. So that's patterns that kind of go off of the page. But when you repeat those patterns, you know, with the bucket fill tool, it's going to allow that pattern to look like it's just infinitely repeating without any sort of seam visible. So if I come over here to a composition I created earlier, and I have two layers here. I have a square layer and I duplicated this to create a square copy layer. So this is just a simple square shape that I drew in the middle of a composition. If I come over to layer, transform and go to offset, this is going to bring up my offset layer dialog box. And I have a few options here. I can either manually set the offset value for X and Y. I can click and drag my mouse right on the composition, right on the canvas, and that allows me to set the offset of this with the live preview. Or I can click any of the buttons in here that allow me to offset it by a predetermined amount. So I'll start with the click and drag option. If I come down here and click and drag on the shape, you can see that this is allowing me to manually offset this and it's giving me a live preview while I do it so I can drag this all around and my offset X and Y values are over here. Remember, I did have two different shape layers for this. That's why you can still see the original shape layer on here. So I don't like this as much, so I'll hit the reset option. The second option, of course, I can just manually type in something and that will offset this and that was just the X value. I can also do the Y value here. I can change the units right here, but I'll hit reset once again. My favorite option in here is the by width and height option. So I can basically set this to be half of the width and half of the height. That's going to place this shape in the corners of my image and that's what's going to give us that seamless pattern. And I really like that this is doing this with one click. So if I come over here and click the by width over two, height over two option, that will automatically put my pattern or my shape in the corners here, creating this nice seamless pattern. So if I went ahead and saved this as a pattern and then used it with the bucket fill tool, it would create like a checkerboard pattern. But I'll hit reset. You can also just do that by the width. So that did not touch the height here. It only did the width. And you can of course do only the height as well. Or in that case, I clicked both, so it applied both. So there's also a section under here titled edge behavior. The wraparound option is what's giving us this pattern look here because that is wrapping our object around into the other corners as we move it. If I hit the reset option and I go with fill with background color, as I move this, it's only going to move the one object. It's not going to wrap the object around here on the other side. But as you can see, all of the area outside of the original layer is going to be filled with white. So that's going to cover up our original shape. So all of this area right here was outside of our original layer boundary. Or I could change this to make transparent and that's only going to offset the single object but all of the space outside of our original layer will be totally transparent. So click reset, and I'm just gonna go with the by width over two, height over two option, and click okay. The next new feature found in this version of GIMP is the ability to move guides that are intersecting with one another on your canvas. So this is another really cool feature, and you know, before when you had two guides on the page, you could only move the guides one at a time. So for example, if I bring a guide down from my top portion of my image, the top ruler here, and I bring a guide over here from the left side. Now we have a vertical and horizontal guide and I'll hit the M key on my keyboard to grab my move tool. Before you could only move these one at a time so you could see when I hover over it, it highlights that active guide with red. So you had to just sort of guess where you wanted these to intersect and do it one at a time. Well now you can hover over the intersecting point and you can move both of these at the same time and that makes it easier to put these guides right at a point such as this one right here or you can just move it to anywhere else on the page here. And it just, in a nutshell, really adds some functionality to this very important feature found in GIMP. 
So the last few things I'll mention about this latest version of GIMP is that the GIMP team has performed several bug fixes within GIMP. So GIMP should now crash less often and the tools should be a little bit more reliable and consistent. Also, Gaggle and Babel received updates. These are very important programming languages found within GIMP. And I think the most newsworthy thing that came from this update is that Gaggle now has better memory management. So if you have a large image open within GIMP and you're working in GIMP for a long time, when you close down that large image and continue working on something else in GIMP, GIMP is going to do a better job of getting rid of all that memory that large image you closed out was taking up, therefore speeding up your workflow as you're continuing to work within GIMP and not getting bogged down by memory problems and having GIMP continuously suck memory from your computer. All right, so that's it for this tutorial. Hopefully you liked it. If you did, you could subscribe to my YouTube channel at youtube.com slash daviesmediadesign. You can visit my website at daviesmediadesign.com. You can enroll in my best-selling GIMP 2.10 masterclass from beginner to pro photo editing on Udemy. And you can check out any of my Skillshare classes by visiting gimschool.com. So thanks for watching and we'll see you next time.